Hello, everyone. Welcome again. Um, let's uh, get started in a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for bringing us together. Allow us to dive into the scriptures that you um, have poured out before us. Allow our hearts and our minds to be open to your will. And let us be able to live out the gospel of Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. So we are on the seventh Sunday in Ordinary Time. So this will be the last um, Sunday in Ordinary Time before Lent. Um, so I hope that uh, everyone's prepared for this uh, seasonal liturgical change because um, it'll be a great one. It'll be fun. So let's jump in. We've got um, uh, great teachings from this from the scriptures this time for this upcoming weekend, um, which is very powerful. And again, it's almost like the church thought of this, right? Um, the readings for this Sunday and for this weekend are a great reflection on um, a good message of preparing for Lent and more notably like the reasonings that we have for Lent about like um, our bodily discipline, right? So we start off um, with Leviticus, right? So we're in the law of Moses. And since it's so short, um, I'll read it together. So the Lord said to Moses, speak to the whole Israelite community and tell them, be holy for I, the Lord, your God am holy. You shall not bear hatred for your brother or sister in your heart, though you may have to reprove your fellow citizen. Do not incur sin because of him. Take no revenge and cherish no grudge against any of your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So two great things are happening in here, right? Um, one that I really love is the idea of be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. This is a great um, homage, right, to uh, Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew saying, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, right? Where the word perfect can, um, I'm going to say that that's another, like, one of those lost in translation examples of the fact that because of our fallen nature, right, we can't be perfect, right? We're, we're, we're not, we're not meant to be perfect. Or whenever, um, you know, you go to confession and the priest says, go and sin no more, right? There's, there is an acknowledgement of the fact that we will sin again, but because we have the mercy of the sacrament of reconciliation, we can come back into um, a state of grace with God, right? So the, this call of be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy is just a reflection of what we'll see in Corinthians with Paul is that like, we are meant for something greater, and that greatness is God, right? Um, that that is our is what our call is. And what I love is that um, just like Christ um, addressed right with with the man um, um, that asked who is my neighbor, right? This question of, well, how do I be holy like the way that God is holy, right? Don't bear hatred for your brother or sister in your heart, right? Don't take revenge or don't cherish um, grudges. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, right? So this idea of if we're being called to holiness, here's the way to be holy. Now, is that an easy task to not bear grudges or hatred? It's not easy, but it is a simple task in the sense that um, we don't have to figure it out, right? Right. God says, this is what it is. And we just, what we do have to figure out is how can we implement it into our, our daily lives, right? Um, so keep this train of the reason that we do things is to be holy like God, not for like our own sake or not for the sake of others, even though we can love ourselves and we can share the love with others. What Moses is trying to get at in Leviticus that gets highlighted throughout the whole weekend is that the whole concept and reason that we're doing any of this is because it comes from God first, right? The idea that we, we don't just say love comes from God, but that God is love. So for us to attain that, we have to also, we, ha we have to look at our own creator to do any of this. I hope that kind of makes sense. Um, 
it's a it's a quick tie-in into Corinthians, but before I jump into Corinthians, any questions? Awesome. So let's go to Corinthians with Paul. And so now, right, if if you're following these readings, right, now Paul is doubling down on this idea of loving yourself and loving your neighbor, right? With a sense of being holy because God is holy. Brothers and sisters, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For the temple of God, which you are, is holy. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you considers himself wise in this age, let him become a fool so as to become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the eyes of God, for it is written, God catches the wise in their own ruses. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. So let no one boast about human beings, for everything belongs to you, Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All belong to you and you to Christ and Christ to God. Okay. So let's break this down. So now we have like coming from the Old Testament and Moses, right? Be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And so with that, now Paul has this, this beautiful imagery of what we can call the mystical body of Christ, right? The idea that not only are we co connected to God in, in an assortment of ways, but that as created beings, right, we are created good, even though we sin and we fall and we had a fallen nature that gets washed away by baptism. But the idea that our that um, the spirit of God dwells in us and that we are a temple of God, right, is a great is a great notion that had to be had to combat a lot of heresies in the early church. A lot of heresies in the early church looked at our physical bodies as trapping our soul, right? And the fact that our soul is really is what has the connection with God and our physical material body is just a cage or a jail. And then once we die, our soul can be set free and, and can go to heaven. Okay. That is not Catholic teaching. Our Catholic teaching is that we are we are a body and a soul. And one, one thing I love that I love that Peter Kreeft says in the in the commentaries for today is that we wouldn't say we have a body. We say that we are a body and a soul, right? God, God made both. It, it, we are a body soul composite, right? That's why you find a lot of the um also heresies with regard to Jesus of uh, people arguing whether or not. Um, how his human and divine nature were together, right? Was he just a spirit that came down or was he just a man that was a prophet? Both heretical, right? We believe that he is fully God and fully man, right? We are a temple of God. So we are a body and soul composite. And that God, when God looked, right, at everything that he created, he said that it was good. And we in our human nature fell out of that, right? Um, with that, right, we have to understand this idea. And I think this was a couple Sundays ago of, of looking at things, uh, of trying our best to understand that, um, there is a, a, a secularization in the world that is not what the fruits of God's creation are meant to be. Right. Like one of the, one of the, like great tag i think like from the franciscans the taglines is that you are not um you're to you're to live in the world not of the world right that you live in this world so that you can do good works that you can love yourself as your neighbor and that you can you can be charitable right you're you're in the world but you're not of the world in the fact that you are just um purely a consumer seeking pleasure right, um, that we are called to a higher standard. So this idea of, in this kind of like middle paragraph of the Corinthians, right, um, God catches the wise in their own ruses, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the eyes of God, right? The wisdom of this world is what's foolish. But we also can look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding with the lens of the eyes of God's those things are meant to call us higher to God, right? 
the knowledge to know who God is, the wisdom to be able to discern and act accordingly, and the understanding that we are not God, but God completely loves us, right? Um, and then lastly, let no one boast about human beings for everything belongs to you. Really, at, at least the way that I would take this um, is that it's kind of like an ego check, right? Um, that if anything can be said about humanity, it is that we think uh, are higher of ourselves, right? Which is a nod to, again, our fallen human nature, right? It's it's almost like we all have an interior tower of Babel that Lent, right, is a great time for that tower to fall down because we don't want to divinize anything that is not truly God. Um, any questions or comments on Corinthians? Giorgio, it looked like you were going to say something. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I have a question. Sure. So I, I guess uh, Corinthians is in Greece, right? Corinto. Mm -hmm. In Corinth, yeah. So who did he talk to at that time? I know you spent a year or so there. Mm. Were they pagan when he went there or the Greek or what? Yeah. So like as in his rounds, um, I would say um, that this like he's talking. So when he's writing these letters, he's talking to the established churches in Corinth. Right. So they the 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 letters that he's writing aren't to pagans he's writing to the to the christian community but that are surrounded by pagan ideologies right so the struggle that you find in in paul right or not the struggle that we that that we find in paul when we read paul's letters and we see that he's like really beating them down it's because this christian community has already been formed but because of their of the influences that they have all around them they keep trying to adopt all these other philosophical and theological ideologies and is trying to like make it into a melting pot with christianity right and what paul's trying to do is he's trying to help them like have a greater separation right that's why in a in 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 paul's letters he like talks about like women's hair length or how people should dress right it's because not not because he's trying to be like militaristic right that's just an example it's the fact that the 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 pagan priest and priestesses would dress a certain way and act a certain way and 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 be a part of society in a certain way so he's calling upon the christian community to completely separate themselves from this pagan way of life and now follow christ in in this sort of way um so for a lot of time you know we can it, it, it's almost like a, a another nod to right the 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 israelites wandering around in the desert how they constantly build false idols and they're constantly being accosted by moses and by aaron right to say like this is not the truth this is not following god we need to do this and separate ourselves um and so with paul and his letters he continually writes to these communities because he's also just traveling around elsewhere right so he's he's telling these i mean they're 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 baby communities right they're they're new followers of the way and so he's trying to help them understand you might have done this in your life in your in your previous life but now that you are baptized you have died to that life and this is your new life but for us i mean it's hard for us to give up our way of life right um so that's why it kind of sounds like are these people are these people followers yes but they're 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 learning to be followers if that kind of makes sense yeah good good comment so who started then these people obviously were already christian community at the beginning learning mm -hmm. who was there to teach them to start so Before this would have been like like paul traveling around would have helped start these communities and then he would have have place right lead like the local leaders of these communities to be there for him right but once he would so we only get the letters that paul sent we don't really have as far as i know um so yeah somebody another math you can fact check me later on um but we don't have the correspondence from these communities to paul right we just have paul writing back to the communities 
Um, so that might have that might just be lost um, to us. I don't know. I'm going to put a big asterisk in there because I promise you tomorrow morning when I start finding out, um, I might catch myself. But I'm, I'm going to say I'm pretty confident in there. But so that's why. Um, um, and he even mentions it down here, right? Um, Paul, Apollo, Cephas, because a few weeks ago when we talked about how Paul was trying to, to mitigate the arguing or the infighting in between all the people of, oh, I was baptized by Apollos, I was baptized by Cephas, I was baptized by this person, that these are now like once Paul has spread the message, these are now the local leaders of the church in the places that Paul went, right? And so now he's writing back to them saying, hey, I heard that you're doing this. You know, I can't I can't go be there, but I'm going to give you this letter. Right. Um, and it's kind of the same way at, that we have like the pope. Right. Whenever he writes an apostolic exhortation or he writes a papal bull or an encyclical. Right. He can he can visit. Right. And, I mean, he's come in. Um, I think it was a year ago or a few years ago that I mean, he came and spoke in front of Congress. He, you know, he travels around all over the world. I'm sure he's traveling right now, but he can't be at all the local communities. Right. So the idea of of a correspondence through like writing a letter or like giving a message to his bishops who then they even can't travel around as often. They have to send out their own letter. Right. Um, so that's kind of like the the idea that we have with Paul is that he can he's helped make these communities on his travels um, when he's not getting beat up or put in jail. Um, but then outside of that, he can write these letters or have Luke write these letters to these communities um, to kind of ch check up on them and give them further um, further teaching, which, again, in, in hindsight, right, really, that's been the blessing because because he was not able to stay in one location right he, the spirit was calling him to travel around so much he had to write letters and because of the fact that he was writing letters now we have them in our scripture to reflect upon whereas i mean imagine just like what john says about jesus you couldn't fill up the world with all of the things that christ did here's just what we could write down um and so i think it's just it's a blessing that we even have this from Paul to go off of. Uh, I know that was long-winded, but I hope I hope that helped too. No, that was good. Thanks. Another quick, quick, quick question. Sure. So, yeah. Paul was a Roman, right? Yes, he was. A, he was a Roman citizen, citizen, um, but not like in Rome. But he was a Roman citizen. Yeah. Now, so, so I suspect he spoke Latin as a normal language. Um. I mean, I don't, I've just thought about it because you said he went to visit. So he goes yeah. to Greece. In Greece, they speak right. Greece. Right, right. How did he communicate? Just curious. I would say that it was largely Greek um, as more of like a colloquial language um, until he probably would have gone around in Rome. Like when he's actually like martyred in Rome, um, then I'm sure he would have also known Latin. Um, but again, not the church Latin that we know of it, like the, the actual like dialogue Latin that, that he would have spoken. Um, but he's from, he's Paul of Tarsus or Saul of Tarsus, right? Which, um, and so same thing with like, with, with his, with his communication with Luke, Luke was also Greek, right? So largely I, I would, I would say not being a Pauline scholar that Paul and Luke would have communicated all in Greek and all their letters were written in Greek. Um, same with the New Testament. Like it's not until the, the Septuagint that we get the scriptures in Latin itself. Right. Um, and because he was a Roman citizen, right. That's why um, Paul was martyred in the way that he was like the, the dignity of being a Roman or the dignity of death of a Roman citizen would be cutting off your head. Whereas the Roman empire was still crucifying and burning people um who weren't roman citizens right so it was almost like that's a it, he he got to die not that martyrs don't die with if you're a martyr i mean that is obviously the highest calling and witness of the faith right to be a martyr but that um the way that paul died was not because he was a christian it was because he was a roman citizen and that's why um his head was just chopped off so that he didn't 
the idea was that because you're a Roman citizen, you you don't have to suffer. You can still be put to death, but you won't suffer to death, if that makes sense. All right. Thank you. Hey, Matthew. Uh, I believe that Paul was a very well-educated person, right? He was a highly educated person. And, and I think at that time, uh, Greek was a language that uh, was widely used for science and philosophy and all of that. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, I think it probably he was pretty fluent in Greek to start with. Yeah, and probably Hebrew, right? Because he right. was also, um, he wasn't just, like, he, he was a zealous Jewish person, right? So he was probably from, uh, he was probably a Pharisee as Saul, right? As he was going around, um, uh, uh, what's the word persecuting christians right until his conversion right exactly. so um he he like you said like he he had to have known he had to have been a well-educated man to be able to not only um speak the language but then in his letters he knows the jewish law very well and so with his so pairing his education of the Jewish law and the Jewish texts, then he has the time he spends with the apostles learning about his, one, not only his own conversion, but like the conversion of the other uh, apostles and their witness. Now he's able to go and, and um, found communities of these, of these new churches and then be able to be a theologian and writing all these letters and, and, and talk about, um how christ is the fulfillment of the scriptures he's he he's not just something out of nowhere that he that if you look back through the scriptures christ really does fulfill everything that he said he was going to so uh, yeah absolutely paul was a was an educated man for sure mm -hmm. and because of that i would say he probably got him in that's why it got him in trouble right because of, of the i'm sure the different dialogues that that he got into it with people um yeah and there's um there's great books on the person of paul so not only just his letters but like his letters paired with like who paul was um there's an assortment of of great books written about paul and i've got some that i've had from class so if you ever if you ever want a book just about who paul was or why does paul write a certain way or anything like that um between me and jason we have tons of books on paul and he is um a, a phenomenal resource it's really funny i think it was um i can't remember when maybe 2011 um, I can't I can't really remember the date, but there was one there was one year where like um, I think it was like Time magazine was going to do their like most influential person right in history. Um, and whenever I asked like the teens um, about who who they think the most influential person is, they a lot of them will say, oh, it's Jesus. I'll say, well, um, if you look at Jesus as like the political figure, he didn't do great. Right. Because at the cross. He had his mother, the other Mary, and then John, and all of his apostles were scattered. Whereas we say that with Paul, influential-wise, he spread the gospel message like wildfire. Um, now that we have to divinize Paul, because Paul writes about that in his letters of it's not um, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me, right? If anything, Paul is very stringent on reminding people that the only reason he's alive the only reason he's writing these letters the only reasons he he will be beat up and go to jail and be a martyr is because of christ but on an on an influential level um christ was the flame and paul was the aerosol can spreading it out right um so yeah great guy and um i think the church would also say he's a great guy too you know Anything else on Paul? Hmm? We're good. Cool. So let's jump into the Gospels. And so now that we've gotten um, something from the law of Moses of reminding ourselves that we are that we are called to be holy because God is holy with um, Paul and Corinthians 
that now we can look to our cells as being temples of the Holy Spirit, right? Here's what Jesus says to his, to his disciples. Continuing this idea of fulfillment, right? Jesus said to his disciples, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other one as well. If anyone wants to go to law with you over your tunic, hand over your cloak as well. Should anyone press you into service for one mile, go for two miles. Give to the one who asks of you, and do not turn your back on one who wants to borrow. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly father, for he makes his sun rise on the bad and the good and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brothers only, what is unusual about that? Do not the pagans do the same? So be perfect just as your heavenly father is perfect, right? What I love about this is that um, like these two lines are kind of really essential to getting Jesus's message across about not just following, like if you follow the letter of the law, that only gets you so far, right? Because that's why he's so um, adamant about um the pharisees and the scholars whenever they come and test him right because he tells his disciples you need to you, you need to over you need to not only know what the pharisees and the scholars know but you have to you have to go even farther right do not the tax collectors do the same if you only love the person that loves you back now you're just in a transaction right and that's not really love and um he says, do not the pagans do the same? So really, Jesus is trying to show here that like, if you're going to be a disciple, if, you, if you're really going to take into consideration all the things that it means to be a Christian, then if, if what you're doing is the same thing as these people over here, then what's the actual difference, right? Because Jesus is calling us to something incredibly higher, right? Um because again, in this idea of living in a transactional society, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, that's justice, right? And then once, you know, if if somebody um, plucks out your eye and you pluck their eye out, then you have nothing, nothing else to be worried about, right? You've made the transaction. But now, right, what is it? An eye for an eye and the whole world goes blind, right? And the idea that if you just keep doing this, sin um doing a bad thing because a bad thing was happening to you doesn't make it good two bad things just happened like that's just what it is right and jesus is trying to stop it at its source where if somebody strikes you on your cheek turn the left if somebody wants your tunic give them your cloak like stop the the transactional mentality at its root because if if we're going to be followers of Christ, if we're going to be holy as our Heavenly Father is holy, if we're going to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, then we have to actually go beyond what is what would be considered um, just in the world view, right? That's the world's wisdom, an eye for an eye. And it's foolishness in God's eyes, right? That's not true wisdom, that we have to love our enemies, Um and I just love that how in, in the scriptures, when you follow this through, right, from the Old Testament to Corinthians to the Gospel of Matthew, right, that it's just this exponential growth of how do we live our lives? Because now, if we can follow this line through, now we are incredibly different than the pagans are, right? We're incredibly different than just tax collectors, right? Because now our whole worldview and our whole lives are are just different right and it's visible right which is the perfect way to evangelize if you're living in such a way that others see the joy of christ in you that's one of the greatest forms of evangelization right um any thoughts or questions on the gospel if anything this is 
again, these readings are great because with Lent coming very soon, the idea of a changing of our mentality of what we do and why we do it, Lent is that perfect preparation period to do this reevaluation. Why do why do I do the things that I do? Why um, why do I profess this faith? Right. And in Lent, if we take that time of spiritual discernment and interior preparation, then we can um, really understand the celebration that we have not just every Sunday, but also the celebration of Easter and then the whole Easter season um, afterward. Um, yeah. Any thoughts or um, any other questions? Any um, does anybody any have any ideas of what they're doing for Lent that is kind of new or novel? I'll take all suggestions. I still got to figure out what I want to do for Lent. So, Cool, cool. All right. Well, I know that that was a short one, um, but again, it's uh, it's one of those where it's like the 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 teaching is simple, but absolutely incredible to do um, in our day to day. Um, because it is simple, but not easy. Um, but the beauty in it is the fact that um, this is not a struggle that is new for us, right? This is this, you know, us trying to figure out um, how to live our lives in a way that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, or to love our enemies, or to not hold grudges. I mean, this, these are things that humanity has been dealing with since the beginning. Um, and if anything, I, I take that as um, something that's peaceful, knowing that it's not just our problem. It has been a problem for the past, and it'll be a continual problem, right? That we have to continually figure out how do we, how do we reassess ourselves, right? Um, yeah. Well, okay. Well, so um, next Wednesday, I don't think that there's going to be a, 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 a Zoom Sunday to Sunday. I know that there won't be a um, catechism in a, in a year meeting um, because next Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. So um, if you can, um, if you're available at seven, you can come to the church and um, receive ashes for Ash Wednesday, a great um, practice to kick off your Lenten journey. Um, so I won't see you um, next week and then jason should be back um the wednesday after that so if anything else i hope you guys have a great lens a good ash wednesday um and yeah awesome so let's go ahead and close in a prayer in the name of the father son holy spirit amen glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.